Can someone finally explain what this holiday actually means? It's about little baby Jesus in the manger with his mama and sheep and gold and frankincense and pearl wise men chose to win little baby Jesus in the manger with his mama. Amphibious Season 3 has reached its midway point with the holiday special Little Froggy Christmas, which despite not intended to serve as a mid-season finale, still manages to put a nice bow on the first half of the season while setting the stage for larger events to come. And between Evil Robot Santa, a holiday song sung by the talented Rebecca Sugar, a ton of callbacks, and an appearance from Darcy, this is definitely one of my favorite episodes of Amphibia thus far. So as always, let's break down this episode for all the details you may have missed. And to stay in the loop of all things Amphibia, please be sure to subscribe to the roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. With all that said, let's dive in. Just like with Season 2's Halloween special, The Shut-In, this holiday installment has a special rendition of Amphibious theme to reflect the Christmas spirit. Most notably, there's a border of Christmas lights the entire time, alongside bells and other holiday instruments mixed into the music, but there's some smaller visual changes as well. Christmas decorations can be seen all around Los Angeles and the Boon Choi household when Anne and the planters arrive on Earth. Santa and his reindeer can be seen in the state's overview, one of the construction workers is wearing a Santa hat, and my favorite detail, when the dark furbles attack Anne and the planters, the color of her calamity hair changes from blue to neon green, with light red branches, though she still retains the glowing blue eyes. This isn't just a Christmas recolor, but a nod at the three gems on the calamity box and the synergy colors of Anne, Marcy, and Sasha. I wouldn't be surprised if Sasha and Marcy's transformations share identical hair colors to the green and red here. Last but not least, the Amphibia logo has been accompanied with snowfall and decorated with ribbons, golden bells, and a glowing pink mushroom as opposed to the usual blue. As someone who favors holiday specials and revamp theme songs to go along with them, I thought this episode was already off to a great start. Jumping to the episode proper, it's only a few days before Christmas and the Boon Choi's are pumped for the holidays. Mrs. Boon Choi going all out with the decorations inside and out the house, dressing up Domino in a little Santa outfit, and topping the Christmas tree with an angelic frog, a cute way to celebrate the planters' presence during this time of year. Alas, the planters are confused by the holiday cheer, questioning if the decorations are fortifications or weapons, which kind of makes sense, given that the villagers of Wartwood load up their homes with pumpkins during the annual blue moon to ward off danger in the shut-in. So of course, Anne has to explain that this is just another Earth tradition. But when Sprit questions what Christmas is all about, Anne's interrupted by the ringing of the house phone before she can elaborate further. This special intentionally dodges addressing the Christianity aspect of the holiday, opting to instead explore the non-religious side of Christmas that people often focus on anyway. The gift giving, the celebration of all our loved ones, sweet, sweet cookies galore. All the reasons why people, regardless of their faith, tend to get that warm and fuzzy feeling this time of year. Besides, Hot Pop would probably debate the existence of Jesus Christ and get the whole show shut down. The Boon Choi family finally gets invited to be a part of the city's Christmas parade through the Taigo restaurant, but Mrs. Boon Choi shuts down the opportunity of having their own float in order to ensure the family maintains a low profile, discouraging the idea of the planters parading around the downtown area, even with disguises. After all, they have the FBI and an evil king setting their sights on the gang, so the risk may outweigh the reward. Mr. Boon Choi's episodic misfortune takes the form of trying to score a perfect candid photo for the holidays this year, but the struggles of flash, motion blur, and angles all stand in his way of achieving success. I feel for the guy. Nailing the art of photography is truly a skill not everyone was born with. You know how long it takes for me to get a good selfie that looks good when it's flipped? Anne feels guilty over her mother's withdrawal from the float, as it's always been Mrs. Boon Choi's dream to be a part of the city's parade, and the family loves Christmas to death. So, Anne calls the committee back and signs up Ty Go for a float, jumping headfirst into preparations as they're working with limited time. Speaking of preparations, Andreas is almost ready for his own plans to be put into action, back on Amphibia, as Triple B checks in. Branson, Barley, and Blair, reporting that the robot army is nearly complete, confirming that Andreas hasn't disposed of all of his organic servants, and that all of them are trying to rebel, like Olivia and Yunin, who are absent from this episode. I imagine the two may likely be imprisoned, or perhaps forced into continuing their service to the king, carrying out the bidding he assigned to them previously. Keep in mind, this episode was not actually meant to be the mid-season finale, the next episode is, but Disney decided to air this one and go on hiatus due to holiday scheduling. So, the next episode may very well be a proper follow-up to the episodes Olivia and Yunin and Turning Point, featuring significant plot advancement on Amphibia that could give a bit more context to Andreas' scenes. Or, it could be another episode grounded on Earth, but considering there seemed to be no mention of the Portal, Mr. X, or any of the other serialized elements introduced in this season, I'm hoping
hoping the next episode does indeed shift perspectives back to the Froggy Frog world we come to know and love. The brothers are also dressed up as elves, reminding Andreas that Marcy once informed them about Christmas and the culture surrounding it. But Andreas seems to be drawing a blank, dismissing any recollection whatsoever. From this, we can infer that Andreas tended to zone out whenever Marcy went on her tangents around others, only intently listening to her when they were one-on-one, -on -one, and he could extract the information he needed without suspicion. Like when the two played Flipboard. I think it's also a reference to Marcy at the gates, and how Anne had no recollection of Back of Bonnie Chronicles, despite Marcy's fixation on the video game series, implying that she also zoned out whenever Marcy went on a tangent. I love this little scene of Blair struggling to push Andreas' gift across the room and up the stairs to the throne. As Andreas patiently watches, it had the same energy as Aku and his henchmen from Samurai Jack. More moments like this, please. The aforementioned gift to Andreas is a new drone that's ready for mass production, piloted by a DualShock S controller and a VR like headset. And the king decides the perfect place to test his bad boy out is none other than Earth, a chance to destroy Anne and remove her from his path once and for all. That's right, folks. We can see Andreas. Andreas try to execute Anne, gamer style. Andreas gets some practice hit on Triple B, who do their best to evade the wrath of their own creation as Andreas taunts them in their tiny legs. The dude is such a goofball, yet such a menace. I truly love him as a villain. One of Disney's best, hands down. Just listen to that bone chilling laugh. <laughs> The second act of the special takes us back to downtown Los Angeles, where we get the first verse of a holiday song written and performed by Rebecca Sugar, who you probably recognize as the creator of Cartoon Network's hit series, Steven Universe, which Matt probably briefly worked on during the show's first season, with other members of the crew universe working on Amphibia after Steven Universe itself wrapped up. So Rebecca's cameo here is very much a full circle moment for the series. The lyrics of Rebecca Sugar's song also play into the idea that the meaning of Christmas has evolved beyond religion. It's a special feeling that can be sparked wherever you are, regardless of if there's snow on the ground or if it's 70 degree weather outside. It's a feeling that accompanies various pieces of entertainment, as the lyrics of the second verse references Elf, Krampus, Rudolph, KFC Japan's holiday party barrels, and a Christmas carol. Regardless of how you celebrate it, Christmas time is something special, spent with the people who make it special. Anne's float plans call for the help of various characters who have appeared throughout the first half of the season. The IT gals, Jess and Allie, the girls that help repair Frobo, who are confirmed to be community college, judging by the location of their robot-centric holiday party. Man, I wish I had a dancing robot mouse who gave me cookies from unconventional places. They help Anne with their tech expertise. Dr. Jan, who's hosting a festive exhibit, offers Anne mannequins and dioramas for the float, and the local Thai community seems to have borrowed some statues from the temple. That sounds like a lot of heavy lifting, but the float looks great. And along the way, the planters still try to better understand the meaning of Christmas, Sprint getting the impression from the IT gals that it's all about the gift giving putting pressure on himself to give Anne the perfect present. Meanwhile, Dr. Jan goes into the extensive history of Christmas and its traditions from various cultures all around the world. Make it stop! My head hurts. It has too much knowledge. Ultimately, Hop Hop connects the holiday to Swamp Hollow's Eve back on Amphibia, minus the ritual sacrifices, which sounds like a mashup of Halloween and Christmas, Tim Burton style. I also love how the museum includes not only Christmas decorations, but Hanukkah decorations as well. Again, this special reinforces that the holidays aren't explicitly tied to the birth of Jesus Christ. During this little montage of the Boon Choice and the planters indulging in Christmas festivities, Polly can be seen pouring some grasshopper legs into the cookie dough, which is probably a nod towards Anne's bug-based cookie recipe from the previous episode. Hmm, how did you get them so crunchy? Oh, that's the cicadas! Frovo has a quick cameo, as Anne uses his glowing robot eyes as a light source while working on the float. And honestly, it kind of bums me out that even though Frovo is now somewhat active again, he's still kept in the garage all in his lonesome. Like, sheesh! Give my boy some more TV time! He's a part of this family, too! One of the float decorations, first visible when Sprig is trying to craft the perfect gift for Anne, is a replica of Chickalisk, the demon they summoned and returned to Wartwood. And Domino gets Sprig moral support by chucking a hairball on him. In the establishing shot for the parade, there's a parody of the 1,000 Hallmark films that roll out every year. A Walmart film titled A Hunky Lumberjack for Christmas, a TV original movie. And wouldn't you know it, a solid 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. The various floats call back to different episodes from this season, such as Construct a Carnivore from Hop Till You Drop and Monday Cat from The New Normal. Of course, parodies of Build-A-Bear and Garfield, respectively. We learn that the Boon Joy parents are immigrants from Bangkok, who 
who found it to be a challenge fitting in when they first arrived in LA. To Anne's mother, having their own float in the parade would mean that they're finally accepted, something Anne can relate to, as she spent her first few months in Amphibia as an outsider, someone who was looked down upon and had to put in a lot of effort to be recognized for who she really is. Efforts that brought forth a lot of growth. Anne continues to develop a deeper understanding of her parents, something that brings them closer together after Anne felt as if she was at odds with them prior to Amphibia. This moment is one of reflection for the whole Boon Choi family, and it's so satisfying to see. I could almost shed a tear. After Andreas tracks down Anne's location over his drone, he makes a very interesting comment. He suddenly gains a recollection of the Christmas holiday, noting the decorated trees, Nutcracker soldiers, and Santa Claus. Considering his earlier dismissal, I think this may be a clue that Andreas' knowledge of the holiday season comes from someone or something other than Marcy. But maybe I'm reading too much into it, and he simply did remember a previous tangent from Marcy. Ready to crash this party, the Mad King utilizes nanobots to transform a harmless Santa flow into a weapon of mass destruction, which could be a nod at Eggman and his robots, given that the process is referred to as robotification, which is similar to Sonic's terminology, robotization. Allie and Jess are captivated by Andreas' Santa hijacking, which I think sets the stage for their role against Andreas' forces in the final showdown. Andreas may have his own robot army underway, but the IT gals are known for their impressive robot creations, a ton of which were introduced in this episode. So it's reasonable to assume that their own, smaller robot army will be a part of Earth's last stand. The gang puts an end to evil Santa by firing a Christmas tree directly into the roboticized float, causing Andreas to rage quit and blame the controls. Like any true gamer, his dumb Fall is definitely input lag and not a lack of skill. This shameless display draws out an appearance from Darcy, who taunts Andreas' efforts, more or less dubbing him as a pathetic king. It's clear that the core looks down upon Andreas, viewing him as an incompetent ruler. This has been a consistent flaw of Andreas since his introduction, as even before he went mask off, Olivia was on his case for his immature behavior. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Darcy plans to betray Andreas, and a conflict between the two is something I predicted in our previous breakdown, as Darcy's inclusion in the theme song now recontextualizes Andreas' expression as a bitter, distrusting glare at his lord. It may become a race to see who will double-cross the other first. First. Darcy also seems to have an elongated wire extending from the back of their helmet, which may be their Achilles heel. Unless they remain plugged in and charged up for comfort, Darcy may rely on this wire in order for the core to maintain a connection. If it's cut, Marcy could be free of the core's control. Speaking of which, another major detail in this scene is Darcy fiddling with purple dice, the same dice Marcy used in her theme song Takeover when DMing a game of Dungeons and Dragons with her Newtopia friends. This is a strong indication that Marcy is very much still present within Darcy. As I went over to my Darcy Explained video, which you should check out if you haven't already, the core consists of 10 eyes on Darcy's helmet as opposed to the 9 on its mechanical shell, representing Marcy's assimilation. I speculated that although she may not currently have a ton of influence in the core, there would still be moments where her personality and quirks shine through. This is one of those instances. Fidgeting with a cube seems like a very Marcy thing to do, and Darcy had to seek out this dice from Marcy's possessions. So if anything, Darcy may be closer to a version of Marcy that fully embraces the negative influences in the core. Darcy kind of behaves a little bit like Sasha in this scene, back when she was a prisoner of grime, constantly berating him and the other toads. And again, we have yet to hear that voice within the core trying to coerce Marcy into letting go of her childhood friends. Don't you think it's time to say goodbye to those childhood friends of yours? yours. I'm sure we'll get a better idea of how Darcy works in the following episodes, but so far, we seem to be in the right path, and I'm very interested to see how this all plays out. We actually get an ominous setup for the second half of the season, with Andrews remarking that against the full force of their army, no one will stand a chance. There's now not only hundreds, if not thousands of robots at Andrews' disposal, but fleets of smaller aircraft surrounding the castle. The invasion is for sure going to be put into motion before the end of the series. We can only hope Anne makes it back to the Amphibia before too much damage is done. As the so comes to a close, and eloquently explains the true meaning of Christmas. I guess it's about spending time with the people you love, and all the presents and traditions are just a way to express that love. Sprig unveils his gift, a model of Anne posing like an action hero, because she's Sprig's hero. Rebecca finishes up their song, and we have a shocking cliffhanger. 
a moment that we've all been waiting for. A pensive Anne is deep in thought at the dinner table, finding the proper words to explain the whereabouts of Marcy and Sasha to their parents, stating that they're still alive and trapped in another world. With letters addressed to the Wu family and Mr. and Mrs. Waybright individually, the latter conveying that Sasha's parents are actually divorced. We finally have an idea of Sasha's baggage. This recontextualizes some of her previous actions and remarks throughout the series, like trying to persuade Anne to spend her birthday with Sasha and Marcy instead of her parents. And this line from True Colors. Sorry, Anne. Say hi to your parents for me. While I find the inclusion of this scene to be a little random, given that there is no real setup to it elsewhere in the episode, no scene mentioning the girls or their parents, and how the holidays must be insanely difficult for the Woos and Waybrights this year, I still greatly appreciate this moment, as it was something we were all thinking about. It was an elephant in the room that needed some acknowledgement in any capacity. I have another video on the works on Sasha and Marcy's parents, since this ending has given us information to work with, alongside hints from Matt Brawley himself that I've yet to cover on the channel. As the man himself has said, Season 3B will be a roller coaster. And there are some very cute details in the credit illustrations. The first illustration features Anne giving her mom the butterfly gift from Hopping Mall, something that was long overdue. Harley got a Narf gun for Christmas, something she pined for earlier in the season. Sprig has a tarantula at figure, referencing the inspiration for his outing as Frogman in the episode Spider Sprig, and Hop Hop gets a book called How to Direct, referencing his new dream at the end of the episode Hollywood Hop Hop. And that's a wrap on Amphibia 3A, the second half of the season, which will also be the final run of episodes of the series, will probably roll around spring or summer 2022, knowing how Disney's scheduling usually operates, but we'll still make sure to have some Amphibia content to keep you guys occupied over the next few months. For December in particular, however, I want to take a step back and cover some big animation outings I haven't talked about in depth previously, such as finally breaking down True Colors and the Craig the Creek Capture the Flag special alongside some other videos I've been wanting to make, so please be sure to be subscribed to the roundtable so you don't have to miss a single upload. But as always, I want to know what you guys saw of this special. What do you think of that Darcy moment? Or the big cliffhanger? Let us know in the comments down below, or keep the conversation going over at Roundtable Vids and at Austin Vox on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you guys for watching, and have an awesome day. See ya!